Manti Teo trying to put one of the strangest sports stories in history to rest, if it's indeed possible, by speaking out and saying he was the victim of an elaborate hoax, not in on it. Now there's word that more people were duped by the same prankster, by a woman by the same name who didn't exist. So where does this leave the linebacker today? And were there mistakes made along the way could have, that could have avoided some of this circus? Former Yankees media relations director Rick Cerrone, who you could argue was the conductor of this circus and trying to put out fires over, uh, over decades with George Steinbrenner and company joins us now. Rick, first off, do you agree this is one of the strangest stories you've ever, you ever heard? Oh, without question. I mean, this is one of the greatest hoaxes along with Orson Welles' War of the Worlds and Clifford Irving's uh, biography of, uh, of Howard Hughes and maybe Paul is dead, but uh, right. but uh, this is this is mind-boggling. 22 year old right. is a, a situation where the whole world, the Sports Illustrated and ESPN have done major stories, local stories about the death of his girlfriend at a young age, and he plays the right. game anyway. Notre Dame rallies this incredible season with a bad finish. So we've turned out the story's not correct. What did the Notre Dame do wrong, or the Fighting Irish? AD and company do wrong along the way they could have avoided this. Well, this is not meant to in any way be an indictment of Jack Swarbrick, the, the fine athletic director at Notre Dame, but, you know, they don't know anything till December 26th, but their response is to conduct their own investigation. Um, it's inconceivable to me and to many people in security, uh, sports security that I've spoken to, that authority, the authorities were not contacted and that the NCAA was not contacted for security help, but maybe that help doesn't exist from the NCAA. That kid, or that young man, he's not a kid, that young man should have been shut down at that moment. At that moment, going forward, he still was confused and he's taking calls. They should have said, a security person would have said, you're done. Right. That's it. No more contact. Just to get a look at the timeline a little bit, evidently on December 6th, he gets a call in Florida right. getting ready for an award show mm -hmm. from the girl saying, I had to fake my death. Right. At which time he puts two and two together and says, I think I've been duped. Right. But for some reason, the athletic director and others aren't folded into this. They're not folded into it, and he still keeps perpetuating this hoax, maybe unintentionally, because he's not sure and he's confused. So we know that when he went to the Notre Dame officials, his coach, his defensive coordinator, the head coach, and then the athletic director, he's still somewhat confused. Somebody needed to get that person from some security person and say, okay, this is how we're going to handle it. They contacted this young man just days before the Orange Bowl from the hotel lobby. Now, he played that game under some kind of duress. How'd that all work out? And you just say, too, it, when it comes to uh, athletes like this, there no one gets through with any oh. even a rudimentary security. I don't care who it is. But, Rick, I want to give, give you a scenario, horrendous situation, embarrassing mm -hmm. situation. You look at that, that's true, true, mm -hmm. true. Having said that, give me a scenario in which you would have recommended how this could have played out before Deadspin got the story. Well, I would have hoped to get some kind of security involved on the 26th of December. But I would have, once we, once their investigation was conducted, I would have made him available and announced this with Jack Swarbrick. The AD. The AD, the head coach maybe on one side and Manti Teo in the middle, whether it's before the Orange Bowl or if you want to wait, well, till after the Orange Bowl, well before they had enough time before that uh, deadspin story broke and say, look, this is what happened and they're there with him. Their plan was to let him announce it on his own. Right. Remember, they said he was going to do it in a week, and then the story beat Rick, them. Rick, I can't tell you how many stories you're in the middle of, huge stories, national stories with the Yankees. But the last question to you is this. What happens to him now if you were working with him today right. had he, as he goes pro? Well, I would tell him to stop talking about this because, you know, like, I still think you might think there's something to this. Move on. What, what you're going to have to worry about now is his time in the 40 and how he handles all these tests that you were referring to. Uh, because, there, you know, he's no slam dunk. I mean, he may be the 15th pick in the draft, but I know a 15th round pick, a 15th pick in the draft that, you know, you've never heard of because he didn't compete well. So now it's all going to be about the competition. As, as we see with Tiger Woods, the psychology of an elite performer matters tremendously, even if you've had success in the past like he has had. Uh, when things fall apart, your head kind of falls apart. Absolutely. Rick, appreciate your insight. Always great to get to you. Uh, always great to see you in person. And continued success. Good to see you, Brian. I'm sure we'll have you in the next crisis. <laughs> All right, now let's go to Rick. Uh, Rick, what's happening outside?